And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ron and Fez on Raw Dog Comedy <laughs> Hits Channel 99. Hi. Simon Head. Hello. Thank you. It's good to see you. It's great to be here. Very happy to be here. You know, the last time you popped in this room, I think we, I was talking with Stephen Merchant. Merchant, that's right, yeah. yeah. I saw him through the window and I just kind of gate crashed. Yes, and then he <laughs> said that guy took all the award. Oh, you you said that the office took all the awards. It did, in yes, space. that's right, yeah. Because yeah. the office was, the office and space came out at the same time and, you know, but it was a popular show. It wasn't as edgy or as cool as space. So, and those, <laughs> those shows has never won awards yeah you know? but it's weird too like something like that would happen in the same year that, yeah you know? absolutely well we actually it spaced the first the, the second series of space came out uh the same year as the first series of the office because we ricky was in spaced uh, playing a character a little bit like david brent because we'd seen the pilot of the office and thought this guy's amazing you know mm -hmm. let's get him in our show and sort of look like we you know we broke him and uh, <laughs> and so I like to say that I discovered Ricky Gervais yeah uh, <laughs> someday you'll be put to death for that but, yeah. uh, <laughs> it wasn't my fault I didn't know what happened uh, I unleashed a monster onto the earth uh, no he's fun and, I, and it was it was a cool thing to have him as be part of it you know well it's kind of cool to go back and look at space now because there's enough time where you can look back and say you know, oh, I see where this ended up going, or Edgar's yeah, eye, yeah. you know? It's 16 years ago now that we started making space, so it's kind of... Uh I actually met the other. There was a, a few years ago. There was a, a sort of slightly abortive remake that, uh, that happened here in the U.S. and uh, um, the, the the show was kind of like whipped away from us without. We didn't know about it, and it went into production. and uh, They made a pilot, and it wasn't very good. But the guy who played me in it is a, a, a really funny and talented Australian actor called Josh Lawson. He. Ca I was in Toronto Film Festival just. I've just been there, mm. and I was at this this party, and I felt this tap on my shoulder. <laughs> it was Josh. <laughs> And I'd never met him before, and he just I just wanted to say I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> so it was, uh, it was not, I did, yeah. I, we had not, you know, there was no ill will with any of the actors that participated. They were just, you know, they got a job in the show. And, but, but for us, it was bittersweet. And, and because I think uh, the, the show had a real uh, passionate following, there was a, a huge sort of anti campaign. It became sure. a very toxic thing. I felt yeah. kind of sorry for the people involved. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took Steve Carell a couple years in this country before people would stop comparing him with Gervais you know? I think well there was that kind of the thing is about the office people always say oh well why did they remake it you know it was so good but the fact is the office the British office was a show that was very popular in in, in Britain and mm. with British people and it, that doesn't mean to say that the American audience couldn't get it or appreciate it but it was perfect to be reversioned so culturally it fitted made a better fit for America so more people in America could enjoy it you know mm. it was nothing to do with uh, it wasn't underestimating the audience here it wasn't sort of saying that the British version wasn't good enough it was just a, a case of making it more available and that's a show that's been reversioned in lots and lots of countries because it, it, it suits that space was was very personal it happened at a specific time it was about me and jess you know it, it it didn't really lend itself to being when you took the idea away from us it was it was pretty kind of like a standard sitcom idea you know a mm -hmm. couple pretend to be married it was you know when you take edgar and me and jess out of the equation it, it lost its soul a little bit i'm not saying that we are it's anything special but it, I mean, it, it was you know what I mean it was, it was a personal show it, sure. it was taking the person out of the personal and yeah. all that's left is all oh, when you do that <laughs> yeah. but you did but you do go back and look and see like Edgar you know in particular of seeing the camera move yeah on a TV show which is you know, pretty rare, but it's funny, like, for years, they would say, comedy exists in the two-shot, mm -hmm. comedy, you know, and you guys, when you get together, you never no. work that way. Well, Edgar, 
was always going to be a film director and, mm-hmm. and Spaced was a kind of proving ground for him to try it. People often, often say, why don't you make a Spaced movie? And it's because the point of Spaced was that it was on TV and that, that you saw these sort of grand cinematic things happening on television. It was, it was big things happening in small places. That's what Spaced was about. But Edgar was always going to graduate to becoming a filmmaker. And a film that both he and I love and we bonded over when we first met was the uh, Raising Arizona, Coen Brothers. Coen Brothers, yeah. And that is a film, when you watch that you see the camera being funny you know you see it made yes. me think oh you don't have to just shoot funny people you can actually the camera can be funny you can tell jokes how you frame a picture how you kind of like return to shots how you that there is a whole spectrum of comedy which can exist beyond just the funny people you know and and it can come from the director his or him or herself and and that for us was our kind of template movie and whenever i'm asked what my favorite film is i'll often say raising arizona because there's not a setup line in the entire film. If you go back and watch that, every line is funny. Every single yeah, yeah, yeah. line you can sit and laugh. And at. also the way that I mean, you see, often with our films, we, we we have you know we incorporate stuff. You you foreshadow things and you bring them yeah. back in. Raising Arizona do that all the time. Just the phrase "Okay, then" is, <laughs> you know, is in that film so much. Yeah, I, I I see that as one of the most influential films on me ever. And that's, you know, when you say that layered thing, it's why it's always tough when you guys get together and you bring, when you do a new film, because your first time as a viewer watching it, you're not going to get anything. So it's like, you know. Uh, I, you, yeah, we get something. Yes, you, yes. <laughs> but I mean, you're not going to get everything. No, no, no. When I saw, time. you know, uh, World's End, I'm, I'm watching it, and then was like, what did you think? And I'm like, I, I really like it, but I don't think it's my favorite because I'd seen the other ones 22 times each. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So it, now that's all, you know, I'm watching that all the time because. I'm now seeing all the colors and putting all the pieces together. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, and in, in this day and age when, when you can watch a film over and over again, you can own a film, you can choose when to watch it, how many times, you can, you know, you can choose what point in the film to start. We right. have this sudden ownership of film that we never used to have. Even in the VHS days, we didn't have it quite as keenly as we do now. You owe it to people now as a filmmaker to create a film which bears up to repeated viewing you know mm-hmm. if people are going to buy these things or download them or pay for them they ha- it kind of has to be worth it you know and for edgar and i we love the idea of watching a film for the fifth or sixth time and going oh i didn't see that before right. you know yeah. and and so we'll do it we'll even put in sometimes we'll put in a punchline before a setup so that you can't get a joke until you watch it the second time <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah and, and it, it, yeah. it's 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 gratifying as a viewer to kind of also be considered not to be stupid. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. So often these days, you know, you watch a film thinking, you think I'm dumb. Right. You know, and, and that's that's not always the best way to be treated. So you guys always think we're making this for people who watch films the way we watch the Coen brothers. That yeah, you who want understand it and yeah. who who want something a little bit more meaty. I mean the the worst thing you can do really is is Make a film which is like a firework display, which you you sure you go ooh and ah, right. but you walk out and you go, well, what did I just do? Yeah, you know that's kind of what the best thing that any film can do is make you think and make you kind of reconsider ideas that you have, or you know make you use your brain a little bit. It's a waste of an opportunity if you just sort of like put on a light show. I take that back. There is something to be said for pure entertainment. I mm-hmm. love pure entertainment. But sometimes it's nice to have something a bit more substantial. And yet there are certain filmmakers like Tarantino where I feel like they do both. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the first time you saw Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, you were like, this is blowing me away. It's nothing like I've ever seen. But then you end up arguing with your friends, yeah. going back to see it again. Yeah, yeah. And that's really what we like in film. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, you have to. I mean, you can't just sort of think, oh, people are like this on the fourth watch. You do have to make a film which you watch the first time and think, great. But when people said to me, you know, oh, I don't like World's End as much as Shaun of the Dead, I I was kind of saying, okay, but watch it live with it for as long as you've lived with Sean and then come back and tell me what you think and then I'll uh, then I won't frown at you and yes and uh, <laughs> and we forget we forget how many times we watched Shaun of the Dead already it's you literally know? on every week in the UK yeah <laughs> it's like it, it's almost frustrating to me <laughs> yeah ITV2 is a channel which just show, it could, might as well just be called Shaun of the Dead channel <laughs> How strange is that for you, though, that something that you've done with your friends, basically? Yeah. You know? Wonderful. And, and yeah. it's something that I, I never, I never, it never fails to kind of like thrill me that 
I remember we did a, there was a, a festival in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, the Hero Complex Festival. They were showing films at the Regal, and they did one about Shaun of the Dead. And to be in this huge historic theater in, in L.A., talking about this little film that we made, we didn't even know it would be on the British cinemas, let alone anywhere in the world. You know, we thought we might get a video release tops mm -hmm. you know and that it that it got the release thanks in no small amount to harry knowles and ain't it cool news who he really right. championed the movie and, and and got it a theatrical release over here in the states and we knew that the american audience would take to it because we were speaking in a language that it wasn't like it was a very british film but we took a very american idea it was a it was the romero zombie film that's part of the filmic dna here in the united states you know and it wasn't anything that you guys wouldn't recognize and it's also wrong to think that you can't recognize that's changing all the time now. In the last 10 years, that's changed with mm -hmm. BBC America and what have you, and you know the, the cross-cultural things that are happening with the US and the UK. But um, it's, been, it's lovely how, how people took to it. And, and when we started to hear that, oh yeah, Tarantino likes it. And the best thing was getting the call from George Romero, who, who watched it in a cinema in Florida with a security guard, which made me and Edgar just hoot with laughter. He's like, <laughs> what, what's he going to do, steal it? Like, didn't we steal it from him in the first place? It's, kind of, it's a double standard. Um, and he phoned up and, and I had this big, long conversation with him. And I was pacing up and down in my kitchen, like so nervous. And he's such a sweet man and, and was sort of saying how much he got a kick out of it and he liked it. And I said, listen, the only thing, George, is that the, the reanimation time in our film is a little quicker than in yours, you know, because Philip gets bitten and he gets and he comes back to life like really quickly and i know in, in in dawn of the dead roger takes about half an hour before he comes around and i was waffling and waffling and there's this big silence and he went you know what simon i didn't mind Which was, <laughs> and i was like oh phew, phew. but uh yeah that was a, that was a real red letter day for us because it was like dad daddy approves and that's the kind of zombies you like you think that's his, that's, his the, that's, the, that's the only kind of zombie there is. Yeah. I don't. Any, any, the minute they start running around, they stop being zombies for me. You know? <laughs> yeah. Then they're like infected people. Right. They're like there's something else. The zombie for me, and I've said spoken about this so much. You know, one of the proudest moments in my life was uh, there's a very there's a lost gem of a movie that was directed by Bobcat Goldthwait called uh, World's Greatest Dad. Yes, it's fantastic. Starring the brilliant brilliant sadly late robin williams and there's a scene in the movie when he's talking to his neighbor about zombies and robin's character quotes me in the weirdest in the one of the weirdest moments of my entire life i'm watching this film and the guy <laughs> on the screen says well simon pegg says that and i, I was like whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're about, about you know death being an impediment and not an energy drink and that was uh, something that i'd, I'd uh, this big article about how you know it's hard to walk when you've got a cold let alone when you're dead yeah. i mean i can't run anywhere when i've got like a snivel so if i was doing it if i was trying to move around when i was dead i wouldn't be running anywhere do you know what i mean yeah so yeah i like the slow the slow it's, it's far more poetic when you're the slow zombie is is inept and kind of sad the brilliant thing that that made romero's films so engrossing and and has made the zombie such a, a an enduring phenomena is that you kind of feel sorry for them as, as a movie yeah. but as a movie villain they are the most sympathetic you know because they're us they're just us dead and that's a terrible shame and you see them in different walks of life romero would always have them like wearing you know washing up gloves or a clown or <laughs> these people that were plucked from their lives you know and you kind of you kind of feel sorry for them and he, he would also make his human characters sometimes a little less than sympathetic so you'd wind up rooting for the bad guy which is really really clever and the minute they start running and shrieking and <laughs> trying to you know it's like oh they stop being poetic they yeah. just start being like you know somebody jumping out and saying boo well what you did uh, what you guys did too and sean was showing how zombie like we are before yes we even get yeah. bad, you <laughs> yes. know and that was like was so great watching it that was one of the times it worked the first time was like is that it is this the zombies no yeah. suburban people <laughs> <laughs> i think well the, the, the thing about zombies is they're a great metaphor for us because they are us yeah they're the walking embodiment of our greatest fear you know and they're us and at that time we were living in the heart of london and it was a city where you could literally step over somebody who was dying in the street as often you would homeless people mm -hmm. you know holding up their hands to you to, to help them and you just like step over them and pretend they weren't there and for us that was like you know imagine if 
would we notice if there was a zombie apocalypse? Right. You know, it would probably be halfway done before you thought, oh, God, it's zombies. Yeah. Uh, and so that was kind of the metaphor that, that it was for us. It was city living. It was the anonymity of living in a huge city and barely ever looking at anyone else in the eye. You, you, you have that here in New York. It's the same thing. When you live with a lot of people, you do your best to ignore them all the time. Yes. It's funny, the, 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 the countries that you, you go to where people have loads of personal space and everyone's very sort of like, hey, how you going? It's, it's sort of weird. You know, I find it being a Londoner that, that you have to untrain yourself you have to start looking at people and smiling a bit right more. as they're waving to you from a block away and you're like what <laughs> yeah, what is it what have I done what do <laughs> yeah. you want from me yeah. we go to uh, you know Vermont here and everyone's just talking to us all the time <laughs> yeah, it's like, we're just freaked what's out what's wrong by with it. this place <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm so glad that you brought up Bobcat by the way because I think his as far as being an independent filmmaker he's doing such great stuff yeah yeah and sometimes i think because his you know comedy career was known in, in one way if he was just like a young guy and just making this and uh, these films now we didn't know his past yeah i think we, we'd be hitting with the genius because people always go what the, the police academy guy right yeah this guy with the funny voice you know <laughs> yeah. him yeah. yeah no he's very clever bob and 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 doing some fantastic stuff and it's important that we have filmmakers making films with a singular voice these days uh, yeah. you know you, we are we do they still exist very much Wes Anderson Quentin Tarantino Peter Chelson who directed Hector and the Search for Happiness is a guy who has a, a particular way of making films that when you watch the film you go okay that's right. a Chelson movie or whatever it's important that we retain those filmmakers because so much of cinema now is you don't really know who the director is you, it's about the product sure. rather than the process you know well you brought up Hector and the Search for Happiness which when you really think about it uh, for the human experience, what else should we or would we be doing? And yet it's almost surprising that s so few films get made. About, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It's a weird thing. I, I was talking about uh, with this about someone the other day. We're living in a time when darkness is kind of like the thing you know it's it's very and not just in terms of it's not just fashionable everything's dark and edgy it's you know the it we're 2014 it's the we're, hard, we're, we're a fair way into the 21st century and we have never seemed more doomed as a species i think we should be m becoming enlightened and kinder and more evolved and more tolerant and yet we seem to be closing down all the time i mean this year has been insane when you look at the news it's unwatchable what's mm -hmm. happening around the world and and it's it's a it's a good time for a film like this because it's a very it, it wears its heart on its sleeve it's not dark i mean it has darkness in it because yeah. it basically says that happiness is part of a continuum that you we, we have to have everything we can't just be happy happiness exists as part of a, a system which includes loss and regret and misery all those things fear we have to have all of that but you know that's how that's how we can be happy if we sort of embrace that you know if you want the rainbow you've got to have every single color kind of thing mm -hmm. and um it, it is unabashedly sort of joyous this movie it's great to sit in a in an audience and watch it and feel everyone sort of like you know smiling and then you hear people sniffing because it gets a bit moving and then everyone walks out all sort of warm and fluffy if you give yourself to that if you go in there cynical with your arms folded it'll piss you off you know <laughs> but if you if you sort of go in there wanting to be happy I, it's been an amazing experience to watch it with audiences and have them come out all gooey eyed and stuff. It's <laughs> yeah. great. but it's funny because you're saying that's the same thing to life that you can't go in cynical with your arms crossed yeah, to yeah. life itself and yet we're almost trained we are to you, do that you, you the, the, the the message of Hector, and this is absolutely key, you can tell by how much I stuttered just then, uh, <laughs> is that it's important to maintain a, a contact with your childhood self. And that's not to say you should be childish or, it, or be infantilized in any way. It means that we have a very pure way of viewing the world when we're kids. It's unadulterated by the burdens of adulthood, by cynicism, by experience. It's really, really pure when, as Christopher Plummer says in the movie, it's a time when everything is just all right. And sometimes it's really good to to take your situation where you are and try and view it through the prism of your childhood self and the easiest example i can give of that is that um when i got the job in star trek and i i for the first time when i put on my uniform and i stepped onto the bridge of the enterprise 
I tried to think of how I would feel about this if I was seven. And the truth was, I probably would have pissed my pants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in the best possible way, you know, it's yeah. okay to be that happy about something. It's okay to, to view something in your life in a, in a sort of, in a, in a childlike way. And Hector is a film about a man who has lost touch with that, but it's narrated by a child. And it's kind of, it's joyous in that respect because it sees the world in big, simple terms. It's, it's a fable and it's, 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 it's a simplistic view of the world, in, uh, arguably. Um, but at the same time, it needs that to tell the story that it tells, you know. What, and so that immediately, the theme itself drew you to, to wanting to be part of the project. because I, Yeah, kind of. I got the job because I was at a dinner and, and I sat next to the casting directors and this happens in Los Angeles. It's a strange place. <laughs> I always say, I don't live there. I live in Hertfordshire and I, I kind of... They, they don't make films in LA, but the, it all, everything sort of seems to happen there. You know, it's like you're in the stream if you're there. You meet, you bump into people in Whole Foods who, <laughs> who, who will give you a job. Uh, you know, go, hey, I was thinking about you for my film. Um, but I literally sat uh, next to the casting directors and they said, oh, we were talking about you today. And I asked them why. And they said, oh, because of Hector and the Search for Happiness. They mentioned Peter Chelson, who um, made two brilliant films um, Back in the day, he's made a lot of films. Two films I really loved of his were uh, Hear My Song and Funny Bones, which are two very strange, uh, sort of um, quirky tales, whimsical in the best possible way. Um, and when I heard Peter was involved, I was immediately interested. Uh, I read the script and liked it. And once you have those two things in place as an actor, if you like the director and the script, then of course you're going to say yes. You know, Sometimes you just go for the director, sometimes it's just the script. But if both of those things are appealing then it's a no-brainer and that's how i got involved and then i you know um i we we took off on this crazy journey around the world and uh, made the film last year because it really is around the world yeah because it, you were following his search but even from your way of saying you could you could do the search staying in your own neighborhood well you the, know? the point of the film is is that i mean we, we, the, laughably i think we ask the audience to to, to sympathize with the, the least sympathetic society right. member <laughs> which is the white middle class male right the affluent white middle class. you think why should i give a shit about this guy <laughs> you know he has he's going out with rosamund pike he has two <laughs> computers he lives in a nice house the fact is, you know, depression, malaise, whatever, happiness, it's, it's, it's non-discriminatory. You, you can be affected by, we've seen this recently with people who you see, oh, they've got everything. How can they be unhappy? Yes. You know, and also we, the character needs to have the wherewithal to be able to make this journey. So this very unsympathetic character outwardly takes off because he thinks if he travels the world, he might find what, at what happiness is. Of course, you know, he finds out it's where he started, but he had to get out of where he was to realize that. There is a particular kind of numbness we experience in, in affluent societies. We're very lucky to not have to fight to survive every day. We're very lucky that we have enough food and clothing and we have choices like television channels and things to eat. And, but the fact is it makes us very numb in a way because we have, there's no context for our happiness. We achieve a degree of comfort and we mistake that for being happiness. And eventually that can become quite you know dangerous in a way because there's no way of you know you sit there with no danger to your life with everything you could possibly want and you think am i happy it's 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 a very strange situation to be in traveling to south africa uh, filming the movie there going to johannesburg to the Brazzaville township, which is in suburban Johannesburg, to Soweto, which is still very much in the grips of apartheid. It's not anything that's going to go away for generations. Politically, sure, it's gone, but socially, it is. the scars are so, so deep. It's not like everyone suddenly goes, hooray, and all mm. the black people move to the white areas, and all the white people move to the black areas, and it's great, we all live together. This is not going to happen. I was in a, I was in a gym in... in, in, in um, in Johannesburg and I was looking around and I said this is great you know there's 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 black people and white people and they're all smiling and they're laughing with each other and I thought okay all the black people work here and all the white <laughs> people are clients you know <laughs> but um it was very interesting to be in areas where you'd see people happier like in a shanty town which uh, is it's called Brazzaville and it still exists it's 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 corrugated iron and cardboard and a, a whole community living in this incredibly jerry-rigged, jerry-built sort of society. But we drove through there a few times filming, and I saw more smiles there, more genuine laughter there than I saw in 
the affluent part of Johannesburg where everyone's a little bit tense and a little bit sort of nervous. That's not to say that destitution is the key to happiness. It's not. But if you if your life is in question. The, the 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 relief that that throws your emotions into is far sharper. So you 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 know what hap you might not be happy, but you sure as hell know what happiness is because when you experience it, you really do experience it because you know what the hell it isn't. You know, right? And that's that's a real, it's it's a really interesting argument because these people who have nothing and you know, who are living a daily struggle are paradoxically experience happiness on a more pure level than people that have everything you know right it's a bit good but then that start throws up questions like oh wait so what should i do throw everything away and live with a gun to my head every day and i'll be happy no you won't but it does it does help you as a human being to kind of appreciate what happiness is well it, it made me even think of you know you were saying that happiness and comfort uh, don't necessarily line up. And what do we plan for our children? Comfort. As much as we can. Get your education, have a place, be comfortable. Don't yeah, take yeah, to yeah. I mean, the only thing that we ever really say to our kids is stop taking risks when they're little. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Don't not be dangerous. Don't climb up there. Don't run out there. Yeah, yeah. And then when you know they hit their 20s and they'll go, I'm just really not sure what I want to do. Yeah. Man. You know? It's funny how often f uh, second children are far more sort of um, capable and adjusted than the, the first children because right. first children are treated like glass. When you have a baby, yeah. don't sort of treat it like and it's going to die every second because it will yeah. grow up neurotic, yeah. you know? And then the second kid's like, yeah, what the hell? Because the mother's just chucking it around. It's going to be fine. Yeah. These things bounce. It's okay. You know? I, I was the third kid and, and I could smoke at the dinner table. <laughs> it's, just, it's true. It's, it's absolutely true. It's really true. He'll be all right. He's going to be home sometime this week. It. Again. He'll let himself in. Yeah. He's, he's five. He can yeah. do it. Uh, yeah, it's a, my older brother and sister would, would go, what the hell? Yeah. What happened to you people? And they it's said, we're true. tired. We just... Uh, and also you learn. You don't... Yeah. There's, no, there's no manual. There are lots of manuals for parenting. But yeah. you can't learn... You, you only learn it when it happens. And so, yeah. you know, by the second one, you think, oh, okay, I'm getting good at this. You know, and the first right. one's like a guinea pig. Yes. Who just winds up a bit sort of messed up and yeah. uh, self-harming. And uh, oh, it's dark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's... Uh, yeah, it's true. I, I think you're right about comfort being... We mistake things for happiness. We mistake yeah. amusement, entertainment, comfort. We kind of see these things... Because we're sold that as happiness. Yeah. In, in a society where we are essentially comfortable and, and, and not um, facing death every day, we're constantly sold things that will make us happy. You know, buy this, watch this, wear this. And, and really, that isn't what happiness is. Happiness is something else. I feel like it's... Doing something that you really, really love. I, I've been thinking about the notion of success recently, and I, I think people attribute sort of like fame and money to being successful, and that it, it's just not true. You know, it, it, those things can they can be fun and they can help. You know, you not experience certain hardships, but I think the true measure of success is being happy at what you do. So you can be shoveling shit, <laughs> and if that makes you happy, then you are a complete success. More successful than someone who is richer than Croesus and unhappy. Mm. You know, success is all about being happy. If you're happy in your life, and you can strive to be happy, you find a way to be happy, you are getting towards being a total success, and you shouldn't strive towards anything else, you know. That happiness is the goal. It seems like there's always some kind of service that has to take place, too. If you see yourself in the service to either your own family or your community or whatever it takes to be, if you feel like you're doing something for somebody other than yourself. Yeah, I think that kindness is a great way of... That, that could possibly be a route to happiness. Yeah. Being kind is like... If you're kind to someone you feel good about yourself. You know, that sounds kind of selfish. You shouldn't do it because of that. But if you make someone feel good, then you feel good. And that's the kind of, that begets more and more kindness. It could, it could spread like a bloody lovely virus if we're not careful. I wish it would, you know, if we were yeah. all a little bit kinder to each other, a little bit more tolerant. I sound like a hippie, but it's true. <laughs> you know, it's like, it sounds, it, 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 things like this sound uncomfortable in this day and age, but it's, it's a basic fact of humanity is that if we were all just a bit kinder to each other, a little bit more okay to accept how each other feel, if it, even if it's different to how we feel, then that would spread, and it's a simplistic argument, but it's kind of true. 
Well, I mean, it's, it makes me sad. You know, it's it's you know it's the golden rule. Yeah. Um, you know, Jesus tried to get the same thing out, and then they, you see what they did with him. So you got to be, <laughs> you got to be a little careful. They were cynical then. As <laughs> yes. Well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cynicism is an easy place to be. It's a comfortable place. But right? it's also ironic to me that at the root of, of a lot of religions is that idea. You know, so yeah. I take a figure like Jesus or Muhammad or whoever. All their all their their goals were, were were about kindness and do unto others all that kind of the, all, all these religions which have you know cancerized in that's a word i've just made up it's a horrible word but it's true <laughs> who have sort of grown into these 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 extremely dangerous sort of like extremist uh, uh cells and groups that their, their roots are in kindness it's sure. a bizarre it's a bizarre thing and also something i'm an atheist so the way i look at it is that these things are you know we create these stories to make our lives easier because we're scared you know we, we're facing an end all of us are it's a terrible mm -hmm. thing for for little existential creatures like we are to have to kind of even conceive of our own end is a lot to ask so we we have these things which make us feel better you know that's how i see it it's not how everyone sees it and if you see it a different way i love you for that but it's kind of it's it's a weird one that some uh, a, a desire which stems from not wanting to be frightened mm. leads to so much pain and anguish you know well, I mean, either even as a, an atheist, you realize that you have to have a spiritual connection to the world. You know, yeah, I mean? not absolutely. not not in the religious spiritual connection, but exactly. I feel more more sort of alive and connected to the world as as than I ever did when I was. When I grew up as Church of England, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, when Henry VIII wanted to get divorced, he invented the Church of England, so he could <laughs> he could get rid of Catholics and then he could get divorced and marry someone else. It's, and now, as a result, a lot of people in the UK are Church of England, which is a, a branch of Christianity. When I sort of started to have my own opinions about that and uh, and, and and decided I, I just believed in science and you know and and the random nature of the universe. I felt a lot more kind of, I felt better in a way. I felt like, mm -hmm. oh good, I'm not gonna, there isn't a hell. I can do this if I want. That doesn't make me any less moral. Yeah. It makes me more moral in a way. It's strange that we're, a lot of us, you know, are governed by the constant threat of punishment. Not just punishment, but burning alive forever. Right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's like hmm, it's the worst thing yeah. like that a smack on the ass. No, yeah. you're gonna burn forever. And and that concept gets introduced to you when you're about four. Yeah, I yeah. remember. I, remember like, I went to a, a cathedral school when I was a kid, <laughs> sitting in the front row, and this yeah. this priest telling me about my soul being like a candle that's gonna get blown out, <laughs> and just crying my yeah. eyes out. Going, what? Can't yeah. be the truth. Yeah, this is terrible. <laughs> but um, you know, it's it, that's we all have our ways of looking at the world, you know. But also. You know, even being an atheist, and if you watch any kind of science, you watch Neil deGrasse Tyson show, you can look at the mystery of this universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And be completely in all. Absolutely. To be included. And it's okay. I think it's okay as well. It's okay to not know everything. I think the right. trouble is because we have such a high opinion, opinion of ourselves as a species, we kind of assume that we are the most important thing on the planet because we can think and talk and, and have lunch and, you know, do things, go bowling. You know, <laughs> we, we, it's, it's a strange thing. We're not, we, we're not of all the species on the planet we're not the most sort of cooperative in terms of our environment or anything we're not an ideal if god exists yeah we're the worst thing he made you right know? we're kind of like the most destructive yeah. awful kind of fucked up nasty yeah. little things on the face of this planet we behave it's like the in the matrix he said well we're more like a virus it's true yeah so why are we so special you know really you know, you look at nature, you look at the way that it's far more connected than we've... There are so many patterns in nature that reoccur. Like, if you look at your brain, uh, the, 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 the neurons in your brain, it looks like a tree. You know, there's, there are flowers which look like parts of the human body. You know, there are sort of... It's, it's, we're part of a, a much, much greater thing. And there are more amazing miracles and f fabulous things in nature and in science that can ever be written in any book by uh, that could ever come out of any human mind you know it's uh we live in an extraordinary place and it's a joy to be here you know and that's why it's really important to to make the most of your time here rather than defer it to some mythical garden you're going to live in after you die because you ain't mm. you know so this is it for you. Yeah. You want to make the best movies, have the best time. Yeah, and it's and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life's amazing. You yeah. Know? It's kind of, it's a wonderful thing. Well, you're, you know, your career has been amazing in the fact that 
you really do get to do more than a lot of other people. First of all, because you have this kind of partnership with Edgar, that, we, that even when you go out and do big Hollywood movies, we never go, oh, he sold out and left us. Cause <laughs> we, we know you're coming back. You Always, know, yeah. you know, and so I, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I don't see I don't see those. I'm not I'm not an actor, who, you know, who does one for me and one for them. It's yeah. not like I do the big films so I can do my little boutique indie movies. I love doing the big films. Mm -hmm. I am having a hoot at the moment on Mission Impossible 5. I it is it is so much fun to work with, you know, the possibly the last great movie star of our time. And it, it's it's he is such a fun person to be around. The funny thing about Tom Cruise is that uh, when you look at him from afar, he's very complex and very sort of like people. He's so weird and Scientology, and he jumps yeah. on the chairs, and oh my god, he's crazy. <laughs> he believes in aliens, all this kind of stuff. You get the closer you get to him, the more ordinary he becomes. And he, when you get right up close to him, he's just like this guy who's incredibly driven, and he really cares about his job, and he he he, he applies himself a hundred percent preternaturally sometimes but that's his happiness he's found mm. he's found his happiness in his work but i love sort of being around him and just sort of poking him about it and sort of uh he, he, and he laughs when he when he takes a step back from his life and looks at it uh, the thing i say to him most is of course you fucking do you're tom cruise right. <laughs> uh, you know he'll he'll say something that that's he said to me the other day i did this movie uh, called Risky Business. And I was like, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, like he has a small story to yeah, tell I know, you. Right? I know. I'm going to tell you something about shit, yeah. really? I'm going to get honest here for yeah. a second. <laughs> but, you know, and uh, you know how, and, and uh, again, about taking things for granted, it's so difficult to stay a legitimate movie star as long as he had. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, his run is like John Wayne's or Jimmy Cagney's or Earl Flynn. And for some reason, like you said, w uh, maybe because it's cynicism, but we lower it down to these a couple things that we can, you know, bust balls about. Well, he's, yeah, he's someone who's, in order to do that, he's had to live his life in a certain way. I mean, you know, it's, it's, he can't be that available to people. He 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 kind of, I wouldn't say he encourages, but he he certainly doesn't go out of his way to dispel the mystique. It's interesting right. to keep this air of mystery about him. People kind of uh, thrive on it in a way. It feeds his his sort of status in a way. He's a, he's a particular kind of film actor, film star, you know. And I get it, and I totally sort of um, I marvel at it, and I, I I admire it to a degree. At the other, in the other, on the other side of that, I think I could never do that, and not, mm. not that I'm capable of doing that. But I would be. We were out doing a, 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 a technical recce in Vienna recently, looking for a place to shoot this scene, and I'm walking around with Chris McQuarrie, who's directing the movie, and Tom, and and you know, you're looking around thinking. No one's can. No one can see Tom Cruise. This is amazing. It's like, he's, and then one person sees him, and then another person, and then within twenty minutes, a hundred people around us with camera phones all going. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah. And he's in the middle, as calm as you like. When I would just be freaking out and sort of like wanting to go and bury myself up to my neck and cry. Because he's had that day for you know three and a half decades or whatever. Yeah. There was an interesting article written recently about the ca the couch jumping incident and how it became a convenient tool or a convenient switch with which to kind of beat him. And what actually happened and what people remember happening is completely different. He was in an audience with a whole bunch of people who, for whom they were his favorite celebrity. Yeah. He was on Oprah. He'd just fallen in love with someone. And I think he kind of leapt up there just once. Uh, he got a bit overexcited. He is prone to getting excited. Yeah. He loves life and all that kind of stuff. This coincided with the birth of YouTube, and he yeah. sort of became the first internet mem, and it became something that was morphed. The whole article was called "Did He Really Jump on the Couch?" and it's interesting. And I, 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 I always think it's a shame when people leap on something in order to to, to have some shared Schadenfreude to kind of like have a, a, a community of, yeah. of or, or a communal kind of grumble it, it just it's 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 bitter and it's not productive it, if we're going to share something we should share joy oh i sound like a hippie again uh, <laughs> it's because i've been promoting this movie about happiness I, I, <laughs> i've been talking a lot about happiness recently and 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 you, you you do get a bit sappy you know i mean well just wear robes wherever you go i'm now. gonna wear you robes holy all but the time. you know you, you brought up the oprah thing go back and watch that because oprah was the one going she crazy was pumping him up. She, yes like, I know, I know. she was crazy and then later when when, uh, you know the shit at the fan she's like I don't know where his head was that day you know she just you right, know, right. she went she away left him out to dry but, it was a convenient way in for such a long time he'd be on he'd been on sort of assailable and it was yeah. a convenient way to bring him down it makes us sometimes it's 
and this isn't helped by the sort of celebrity media which which f f fosters so much interest in this side of things i hate 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 so much i hate i'm gonna say it five times hate <laughs> when people call me a celeb <laughs> right now i hate being i'm not a fucking celeb okay i'm an actor and yeah. and there, there is and a writer uh, <laughs> and hopefully a director one day uh, but but the 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 this word it's like it, it's so, it's so passive aggressive it, it it's such a reduction of who you are it's like you become this sort of facile meaningless thing that's only in it for the re for the for to be that thing yeah. and for me it's the second worst c word in the language <laughs> do you know what i mean and i love the first one by yeah. the way <laughs> but it, 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 it's a weird it's a weird double standard and those 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 magazines which have hey they're just like us kind of pages right it just do nothing but engender that separation but see the thing is too is like i i would guarantee that we all love jack nicholson but the house would be the least part of that equation right, right you know right. it's coolness it's creativity yeah, yeah and that's what we used to care about yeah you yeah, know yeah. at one point like you loved miles davis because he could play and he was very very cool but somewhere around the 80s it got into maybe it was lifestyles of the rich and famous look where they live look where they vacation yeah, yeah who yeah. gives a fuck he's jack nicholson yeah, yeah, if he's yeah. standing on a street corner it's that's weird, the coolest thing it's weird it's a, yeah it's a strange double standard i think it's a i always see it as being like radiation if you work in a nuclear power plant uh you're going to be subjected to radiation. That's just part of the job, and you have to be okay with that. But to say that the radiation is the best part of the job is really weird. Mm -hmm. And it's it's nice to be. It's nice to. I love it when I meet people who who've seen the films I've done and who like who come up and say, "Hey, I saw Shaun of the Dead, and I, I changed my life," or whatever. It's so amazing that 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 I would never ever be cross at someone for coming up and saying that or wanting a picture, all that stuff. You have, even if, if it's the hundredth one that day, you've got to take it with good grace because that person has, has had to get a bit of courage up to do that. So you, you know, that, that stuff is, is fantastic. And it, it, it's not something that I ever would ever complain about or, 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 or want to go away. But it, it is a weird thing that, that that side of things has become seemingly more important. Nowadays, when you see an award ceremony, the red carpet is the program we will watch. Right. When the awards come on, fuck that. I'm yeah. gonna, I'll switch over and watch something else, you know. Yeah. It's a strange thing. It's become it's become very um I think maybe because it's the notion of being on TV or something has been slightly demythologized by v the video camera. It used to be before we could own films and before we could tape television, the television was a box in the corner of the room that owned us. If you weren't in front of it at a certain time of day, you'd miss your favorite show. You had no yeah. say, you know. And then suddenly we began to be able to tape our shows we'd be able to began to film ourselves and put ourselves on tv and the whole notion of celebrity became a lot more kind of grounded and without mystery and and now it's become this thing which we all feel entitled to and are constantly fascinated by it's a strange condition of the modern age but you just reminded me of being a kid and like your aunt would or, or grandmother would show up during happy days and everyone, <laughs> you're like no no <laughs> not now <laughs> yeah. what you're are you insane? My life. <laughs> <laughs> get out <laughs> this is happy days time but yeah that has changed like only sporting events do people really feel the need to watch yeah live absolutely now. it's kind of a shame i i miss having and this goes back to the notion of choice and how choice is possibly dangerous, which sounds like I'm being some sort of pro-communist nutcase. Yeah. Uh, it, it, if you have a thousand channels to watch, all you'll ever do is change the channel. When I was a kid, growing up in the 80s in, in, in the UK, we had four channels. That was it. You'd turn on the TV and you'd pick something and you'd watch it. No matter what it was, it might be a wildlife documentary. <gasps> it, might be, it might even be something serious or challenging. You might actually stay and watch something which made you think, you know. But with this, it's like, no, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to watch that. Yeah. I don't want to watch that. And it's, it's kind of the more choice we have, the less content we are in a way because it, it seems like we, we can't settle on anything. Yeah. Well, you know, when the Beatles came over this country... It, when the kids were waiting for the Beatles, they had to sit through a juggler and then, you know, <laughs> Russian dancers. So you were forced yeah, yeah, to yeah, see yeah. things while you waited to see that one thing yeah. that you did. There's no way a kid 
would sit and wait long enough. No, 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 absolutely not. No, children, God, they don't know they're born. No. <laughs> fetuses, don't know they're born. Uh, I have a thing about the Beatles. Uh, yeah. I have a theory about the Beatles, to just to bring things to a, a light place. That they, the Beatles, if you want to impersonate the Beatles, now I know you all do. If you want to take this <laughs> yeah, to a, right. if you want to take this to a party, the Beatles all live in a different part of your mouth, which you can use <laughs> when impersonating them. Okay, I'll demonstrate for you now. <laughs> <coughs> So John Lennon lives up here, right? When he talks, he talks like this. Paul McCartney's up there, you know, the top of your mouth. It's up here like that. Ringo's right at the front. He talks like this, right under his nose. And George is sort of in the middle like that. <laughs> so when you want to impersonate the Beatles, just remember it's back, top, front, and middle. And then... <laughs> The Beatles in your mouth, I think, would be a <laughs> fantastic children's Some book. There probably could yeah. say that they have. You never yeah. know. <laughs> it was probably the sixties was a good time. Quite a few, <laughs> at least with George. Um, you know, uh, you got other stuff coming out now as well too. Is yeah, Box I, Trolls is I, yeah, Box Trolls is is out soon, which is a fabulous animation from the guys that did Coraline and Paranorman, yeah. the Leica Studio. They're still doing the the stop motion animation, which is you know a, a technology which has kind of been a little forgotten in the wake of CG, but has still evolved and become something wonderful. And the artistry in that movie yeah, is they staggering. Take it somewhere else. Even else than oh, it's been before. It's amazing, and it's a beautiful, beautiful film. Great cast: Sir Ben Kingsley's in it, and Elle Fanning, and Isaac Hempstead Wright, who's Bran in Game of Thrones. Any Game of Thrones fans will know who he is. Um, and yeah, that's coming out pretty soon. And then I've had a busy th year this year with. Um, I did a movie in uh, London called Man Up, a, a, a rom com in Man Up with um, Lake Bell, who's an actress I think who lives Fantastic, here in, in yeah. New York. Uh, I did a movie with the Monty Python. Uh, Terry Jones, uh, and and in a moment of sadness, uh, one of Robin Williams' last performances, he he, he voices my dog in that movie, Dennis, hilariously, uh, um, and I'm very happy to hear that he uh, managed to complete you know everything before he d decided to leave us. As tragic as that is, there's no good thing about Robin Williams going, but I'm I'm happy that he's going to be in this movie, uh, and Mission Impossible Five, which is uh, which is currently in production. And um, I can also report that I've been on the set of Star Wars, and it looks amazing. You have. <laughs> now, Star Wars was the kind of moment of your youth that yes, probably absolutely. set everything in the motion. A hundred percent, yeah, yeah. And I was very excited. Well, actually, when I first heard JJ was doing it, I got upset because I was like, "Oh no, Daddy's going to go play with someone else." Right. You know, it's like I phoned him and said, "Is Star Trek going to be like the the um, the less cute older sibling?" You know, <laughs> now you've got this new baby to play with. Right. That's not true. He'll he'll be very involved when we make Star Trek three next year but um yeah I, I i live very close to pinewood uh and you know when your friends down there making a film of course you're gonna go visit and have a look around right and, uh, um it's very exciting and remind them that maybe you're available for the next <laughs> one yeah right yeah but in in deference to jj's um wonderful sort of uh, uh approach to secrecy I, I won't say anything but it, all i can say is and this is known that he's decided to approach the movie very much like they did back in the 70s which was to use a lot of physical stuff Stuff, to not rely too heavily on CG uh, to get this is a story I told him this is absolutely true uh, early on and he took this into meetings um, when he was they were talking about you know making the new Star Wars film when I showed my daughter the Empire Strikes Back she's only three I couldn't wait it was a night you know it's like I, I just watch it now I can't wait for you to be seven uh, we, she watched Star Wars, she liked Star Wars, she was a little frightened by the sand people and got a bit bored towards the end. She watched all of Empire Strikes Back, which is strange because it's a darker movie. But when, we were, when uh, Yoda first appears on the screen, um, she'd never seen the Frank Oz Yoda. She'd only ever seen the cartoon Yoda or he's on a commercial in the UK advertising cell phones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she'd only seen that guy. She'd never seen the puppet. And and he sort of he when he appears, I saw her sort of sit up and she looked at the screen and then she looked at me and then she looked back at the screen, and she watched it for a bit and then she said, "Daddy, he's real," <laughs> and and I kind of like burst and cr crying. I was like, "You're my child," uh, and it was because he's there, you know, he's there interacting with Mark Hamill and all. Yeah, you know, even if he was CG, we'd still know he wasn't really there because he's a little kind of long-eared alien. But the fact that it was a puppet who was existing in the same space as Mark Hamill talking to him. 
it made her believe in him in a way that CG would never do, you know. And I told JJ this, and, and JJ went into a, a number of meetings in, in the sort of period leading up to making Star Wars, and I think used that as a, as, a, as a good argument for using puppets and masks and that kind of thing. And when I did go to visit the set, one of the puppeteers came up to me and said, hey, you're the guy whose daughter saved Star Wars. <laughs> 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 Which was probably one of the greatest moments of my life. So, you know, I know that JJ had always planned to do that, but it was a nice little um, validation of that impulse, I think, to have a, a child of that age say that. Yeah, and we know it instinctively when something is what we consider real. You Absolutely. Know, we've gotten so far yeah. away from that. But it, it, everyone is, you know, if you even go back to the first Jurassic Park. Mm. The fact that he mixed totally, yeah, absolutely. I, I honestly thought maybe there was dinosaurs at the I time. Yeah, it's so well, uh, and because yeah, the mixture of models and CG, yeah. you you couldn't quite tell which was which, which was amazing. And I think that the the key is with something like a dinosaur or an alien. When we look at the screen, we know it's not real. It's part of our brain is having to say, let's pretend this is real, whether yeah. it's a puppet or not, or whether it's a puppet or CG. And it, it's there's something to be said for something being in the room, for being physical. And I, I feel like it's like synthesizers. When synthesizers first came out in the right. 80s, everybody was like, instruments are dead, man. The guitars, <laughs> bury your guitars, there's no more drums. This is it. It's all about, you know, synthesizers. And everybody was making music with synthesizers. And there was a period when they, they were so overused that all music was electronic and then yeah. eventually it took its place in the pantheon of instruments and is used responsibly and <laughs> yeah. you know sparingly and correctly now and I think that's what CG is going to be like but, you know? but it's also fun to go back and see like how many 60s and 70s great artists made their shittiest work in the 80s? <laughs> you know, like Van Morrison. You're just like, Neil Young, what were you, what were you doing, man? <laughs> you had everything. <laughs> and I did think that happened with like a lot of filmmakers as well. You know, the, as soon as they thought like, oh, I don't need a giant cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you go back and watch some of those 1950s, you know, Ben-Hur, you're like... Fuck! I know it's, it's the incredible. greatest thing ever. Or you watch. I never, for a second, when I watched Jason and the Argonauts when I was a kid, right. thought oh, that's not very good. Right. You know, because I believe those skeletons were fighting with swords, and you yeah. know, because part of the joy of watching a fantasy film is suspending your disbelief. Yeah. No one's asking you to believe that anything you're watching is real. That's your choice to do that. If something's really shonky, then you think, well, you didn't make much of an effort. But yeah. if someone, what I love is is being able to say, how did they do that? And when something is very, very computer generated you just say oh somebody just sat in front of a computer and built it it's there's no mystery yeah but if you watch a film and think and are puzzled by it i love that feeling of of, of wondering how the hell did they do that you know wouldn't you just love to grab someone now and watch them watch jaws for the first time <laughs> just sit there and watch that happen to someone yeah because that scared the hell out of a, a planet absolutely you yeah know? it's incredible isn't it I, I i it's interesting to show children old films you know and i yeah. I, I recently with, with Tilly, I, I show her old movies as much. We watch, me and Tilly sat and watched The Incredible Shrinking Man recently, which was, uh, I think, 1956. 50, yeah. and, and, black and white. Yeah, totally black and white. And really, really, I mean, the special effects in that are from the 50s. Yeah, they are. And she loved it. She watched it completely all the way through, bought it, was weirded out by it, was slightly frightened by the spider. Yeah. You know, and kids just kids are okay with that kind of stuff yeah. we're, we're being spoon fed too much we're being underestimated too much yeah I remember seeing that when I was a kid too like that and, and thinking oh this is silly at first and then I couldn't sleep that night <laughs> just like I don't know how but if I start shrinking this will be the worst thing that ever happened and that's really what you know that's what we want out of yeah. these experiences it's a great you know? the, the, the thing I love about that movie as well I forgot about when yeah. I was first watching it is the the first half an hour he's only shrinking like a few inches right. like it's, it's not until the end when he's becoming like you know yeah. fighting a spider at first he's just like hey I'm five foot six what the fuck pants are a little yeah, bit baggy like, yeah he is there's a whole yeah. scene where my pants don't fit yeah. which is hilarious you know well you know in, in playing uh in Star Trek too that's something that meant something to so many different generations yeah. one things that people in the 60s and 70s and especially plays Scotty yeah. which is an amazing you know all those guys went off and kind of were those people for it, a lot of years it was a hell of a thing all of us uh, taking on those roles 
had an interesting job ahead of us because we didn't want to go and impersonate any of the actors the, yeah. because the, 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 those actors became almost you know indistinguishable from their characters they were so iconic so beloved so famous that none of us wanted to go and do an impression of you know for for chris to do chatner or or for zach to do leonard even though he, he kind of zach because spock was a certain way he had to kind of mm -hmm. we all of us had to kind of approach our characters in the same way that our forebears did but i tried to look at the page and say okay he's scottish and he works in space not try and do an impression of jimmy doohan because that would have done him a disservice um it was an interesting thing to do and i i think um jj JJ did it very well. We, we 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 approached it with great reverence, but at the same time knew we were trying to open it up to a new group of people. Had to ask the fans to say, "Do you mind if we?" Is it show this one, to right? Yeah, a little bit. I and mean, some yeah. fans don't like it. Some fans, you know, the, the, the Into Darkness really split the fan base down the middle because I think, uh, it, you know, we didn't we stayed in, in the sort of around Earth. We didn't set off on the five year mission, which was a problem for them. The whole fact that we took on one of the most beloved, uh, you know, villains ever in Khan and sort of reinvented them a little bit. Um, and I get it. I understand why why they would. Although I am quoted as saying "fuck you," uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was told that uh, that Into Darkness had been voted the least, fa the, the worst Star Trek film ever. And mm. I think my, my oh, "fuck you," <laughs> but I do get it. And I, 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 it's it's one of those things when you take a beloved property uh, and and you try and you know breathe life into it. What I hope is that what it means is Star Trek lives on and, and with a bit of luck if we do make the, f the third one next year then Star Trek 3 will come out on the 50th anniversary or the year of it's, insane. it's been around for 50 years yeah. Star Trek you know you know I had a club and Jimmy came in uh, years ago and we introduced him from the stage and everyone you know because it was dinner and he stood up and everyone went crazy and it had to be you know 35 years after he started or something and he, you know, he milked the applause, and I don't think ever sat down again. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And it was 35 years after he had done that role, and people act like a long lost relative. Yeah, it's come incredible. Into the I met him weirdly enough. Yeah. In 2005, three years before I got the role, I, I met him at a, a science fiction convention. He was very frail. He'd had a stroke, and he, he died not long after that. But uh, I, 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 I think of that sometimes and think. If only both of you knew at that time, right. you know, as I shook his hand, that I'd one day sort of like play the part that he created and made famous. And his son, Chris, who I've become friends with, who also plays Scotty in an amazing web show called Star Trek Continues, mm -hmm. which you should check out because they have made it like exactly like the original series. And they picked up where the original series ended. It's amazing. A bunch of fans got together and made this extraordinary show, Star Trek Continues. Chris gave me a pen knife that belonged to James, and which I keep. You know, as a as a as a memento of him, and and to remind me that I'm not the first or the best Scotty. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to have somebody hold it up that it means something to you. Know? Yeah. I mean, that's the the beauty of it. Yeah, we all managed to. I mean, apart from uh, Carl Urban, who uh, unfortunately DeForest Kelly died before you know we started. Everyone else has met their their forebears, and um, and particularly with Zach and Leonard Nimoy, they've become good friends. There's a great commercial, I don't know if you've seen it, <laughs> yes. where they, yeah, it's yeah. brilliant, so funny. Simon Pegg, thank you so much thank for coming you. in here, and um, Hector in the search for happiness. I hope you find it all over time, my friend. Thank Take you, care. man. Good to see you. Simon thank Peck. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, buddy. You know what you've been doing? You've been listening to the Ron and Fez show. It's now over, but don't worry as whenever you want. Go to SiriusXM.com slash on demand.